a while ago here at the Mill Serp Garage, we brought you a pair of Marlin 22 rifle videos. Model 88 DL, Model 80 C. And these were pretty popular. You guys seemed interested, so we figured we would turn it into a trifecta with the Marlin Model 81 DL. Let's check it out. Serp Garage Marlin Model 81 DL. The L back in these days of Marlin were the deluxe models. So, like I said, the um, the other two Marlins that we did back to back were very popular. And I saw this thing and said, you know, they're popular for a reason. These things are awesome, and I'm getting this. So this is a pretty recent acquisition. And I uh, couldn't be happier with it. Let's get over some nomenclature right off the bat. So it's 22. Take short, long, and long rifle. And the capacity is 25 shorts, 20 long, 17 long rifles. Because this happens to be a tube magazine gun. So the fact that it is a deluxe separates it from the 80 that we did. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have to be doing back and forth comparisons here a lot because um, it's basically something that would be interesting about these is how they changed uh, through the years. They were versions of these. So if you remember, I encourage you, listen, I put the link down in the bottom. Go take a look at the 80C video first. The 88DL was an autoloader kind of like in a class all by itself it's like a different rifle but this guy the 80 and the 81 were really only differentiated by the 80 had a magazine box magazine a uh, eight round and the 81 had the tube magazine but you look at these and you say well wait a minute these things they they look different though i mean the trigger guards are different stocks are different the receivers look different. Like, you know, they're just different. So how could that possibly be? Well, there's different versions. So if you get the same version, just with the different mag, they're going to look the same. This is why when I first saw this thing, I said, oh, the 81. Yeah, I have the 80. I'm covered. Right. But then when I went and I really researched my own collection and saw that the 80 was a different version than this 81 that was for sale. I ran back and I picked it up and I got this thing for a, a score. Um, they never really charge a lot of money for these uh, older 22s to begin with. But when you get a deal, then it's really, how do you say no? And you say that a lot when you look at these 22s. How do I say no? You know, do I put gas in my car or get a new rifle right i mean it's like that's literally what some of these cost it's like a tank of gas let's talk some years here oh and that was still on the nomenclature just 24 inch barrel yeah two magazine bolt action we've been there before um these were manufactured from 1941 to 1964 and that's just the dl's they had a larger run. So let's see. I would need like, I got Brophy's book here. I had to bust out the book like so immediately. But this Marlin book right here, Marlin Firearms by Brophy. I feel like I'm way zoomed in. I don't want to move the rifle just yet. So I'm just going to lay this down. But this is great when it shows bolt action rifles. It shows everything here. So let's go. I, I just want to, I want to be able to take a look and see. So, so the, the 81 yeah, see, the 81, 1941 to 1971 for the Model C. It's just this, 1941 to 64. So they stopped production of the Deluxe model in 64. But they went way into the 70s with this guy, into the third version. So when you see the 80C video, that's the third version. That's why that one's later. That's Microgroove, the 88DL. Microgroove. Microgroove is after 1953. 
you can use a couple of patents like the micro groove patent and the extractor patent. This is the extractor collar here on the bolt. And you could use these patents. We're going to take a look later. You know we're going to look into patents. Those patents can be used to date these because moving through these versions had a lot to do with things like that. When they changed this extractor, they jumped to a different version. But then it's like where you get your information makes it sometimes dicey to date these things properly. But I'm going to date this at 1952. So this came out the year before microgroove. So where were we? Ballard type rifling. That's what Marlin called it. Marlin back in like 1891 had the Marlin Ballard rifle. So I'm only assuming that Mr. Ballard invented a type of rifling that they could, they called their rifling the Ballard rifling all through the years till they got to the microgroove. And the microgroove there's a lot of people, they talk a lot of, like Marlin Heads will say, oh, the microgroove was revolutionary. It was a great thing. Um, and then a lot of people think, well, they went to a cheaper method of button rifling, which we talked about with the Charter Arms Bulldog, how that rifling was created, pulling a button through the barrel. Button rifling takes like five seconds to rifle a barrel instead of actually having to cut deeper grooves, which would be like the Ballard rifling that took a while. It could take... 10 minutes, 15 minutes a barrel, something like that, believe it or not. So obviously, if you're going from 10 minutes a barrel to 5 seconds, you're speeding up production, you're lowering production costs, you're making more money. So a lot of people say Marlin turned that into a, uh, hey, there's less deep grooves and there's more of them and it's better for... I mean, maybe it was. Maybe they just uh, created a process that was cheaper to do, easier to do, and was better. I mean, the jury's out. Do your research. You know, like come up. I find them all accurate. So there, I'm not that good of a shot where I'm going to notice uh, the difference. All of these things are tack drivers, though. These Marlin bolt action rifles. Oh my God, they are super accurate. I, they definitely make me look good. Let's put it that way. So, um, okay, back to some Back to some dates here. So the version one of the 81 DL, the version one would have been 41 to 51. Version two would have been 52 to 60. Some places I'm reading, maybe it was 52 to 59. Or 57, I'm sorry, to 57. I'm thinking it was 52 to 60. So that's what I would stick with, but there's a chance... Somebody really knows better um, chime in. But and that's what I'm coming up with. Then version three would have been, of course, 60 to 64. Um, so this would have made, at 1952, that would have been the first year of the second version. And also the, year, the last year of the Ballard-type rifling before they moved to Microgroove. It has a... Uh, Aperture sight. These deluxe ones did have an aperture sight. Now uh, I'm gonna. I want to bring back the 88 DL because this was a deluxe model. But if you remember when we did the video, we had a scope on here. This was, um, a, you know, a, a, a production year where they had a groove here for a scope. So somebody, which was common back then, you see the rear sight is blanked out as the deluxe, very similar to this guy. The rear sight is blanked out because it has the aperture sight. This one had the aperture sight connected back here, but it was gone. It's not in here. And uh, so I got the deluxe model without the aperture. I never have good luck with these aperture sights, but interestingly enough, this is the second video in a row with a uh, 22 with an aperture sight. If you remember the very last video is the 521T with the aperture sight and if you see i since then somebody told me that haviland sales has these and it was only 20 bucks shipped for the little uh, reticle little eyepiece thing here the uh, little peep tiny hole peep so i got it oh and also uh, just a quick note somebody um made a uh made a comment that you could store that they looked under the butt plate 
And in the storage compartment, they found their peep sight. They didn't think the rifle came with the peep sight. This was the 521T, and they said it was in the uh, compartment behind the butt plate. I was like, really cool to know that there's a compartment. I took this off. It's just flat wood. I don't know if someone routed a compartment out there on his. Um, people have been known to do stuff like that. Or maybe it just uh, it was a different stock, different kind of stock on it that was on it or something. I, I don't know. Different year. But uh, mine does not have that. Just a heads up. And uh, the Sears models, you know, the Sears uh, uh, off-brand, you know, they always had a number. So it was 103.1982. That is the Sears version of it. I'm trying to remember if 52 is J.C. Higgins. I guess it would have been J.C. Higgins. But if you see 103.1982 on yours... That is this rifle. And they also went through different versions too, believe it or not, you know. And, uh, yeah, so what did the Deluxe give to you? The Deluxe gave you these awesome sling swivels. Oh, of course. Of course we're missing the bullseye. We had the bullseye on both of these. I got lucky. The 88 DL has the bullseye. The 80C, of course has the bullseye this one nope we just did a model we had one not too long ago that the the bullseye was missing i have to go on like at the find a company that has those and like just buy a little box of them so i'm ready believe it or not the different models there are different sizes and different i guess that just because they're all at different angles or different they're on curvatures so there's just like different ones apparently so you can't just get one size does not fit all with those bullseyes you know but uh you know i don't want to get aftermarket i would want to get like original ones so they're not that easy to come by so that's what happens you got the peep site back here and of course here's why here's what annoys me about these peep sites okay so so here's the peep site just like on the 521t there was a part missing here's my peep site i see it in the store i'm like yeah it's all here there it's got it's got this this one has this little screw on aperture there it's there and i'm like well oh, that's there the adjusting screws are there it's 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 all there i'm good but nope here's what it's supposed to look like look at mine again here's what it's supposed to look like see that part that like arced um like graduated piece of metal that's supposed to i guess it's when you tilt it forward and back or up and down something it's supposed to adjust something this one it locks into place and it works just fine but there's a piece missing i just hate these aperture sites they they cost as much usually i guarantee you if i went to buy this aperture site on ebay or wherever i would find it i guarantee you i would pay more for this aperture site than i paid for the whole entire rifle i can guarantee that um and that's the way that's that's why they just annoy me <laughs> the aperture sites annoy me um yeah the sling swivels are kind of cool and it comes with uh, i think this hooded front sight not sure if the front sight comes hooded and look these marlins always have like a really cool gold bead that i polished up with a jewelry cloth look at how nice that bead is that looks really nice when you're sighting down and this ramped front sight has something to do with dating them too that it doesn't have a band around the barrel and these uh magazine tubes are aluminum Believe it or not, check these out. This is a good one. Very, very high quality. You know, we've talked before about when you load them up and then you can always tell a high quality one because you don't have to fiddle with it. You load this full of around 17 of them fit in here. And then if you could just go whoop, push all the way down and turn at like one shot or two shots, it's a good one. If you got to sit there trying to get them all stuffed into the magazine, that's the ones that are crappy. This is a nice, smooth, good one. It really does work well. So the 81 DL, this is what Marlin had to say. Marlin had to say, shooting efficiency with least fuss and bother. Because they would consider loading it a fuss and a bother, I would assume. Uh, and the fact that you could do 17 long rifles in here compared to eight, I mean, that's like more than double the capacity of the box magazine ones, you know? And it's really funny because you see in the ads, 
they have like different animals that you would go like, like the, the the box magazine ones that are like the 80 they would say like oh it's good for squirrels and rabbits you know what i mean but then when it was like the, the 81 the fact it's like has more ammo so the animals would change it would be like owls foxes and you know whatever <laughs> like we would think it would take twice the ammunition to uh, kill those for some reason um, also patented non-jamming feed we're going to check into that that's a hard patent to find by the way i did my best man i'm telling you i did like an hours long research somebody somebody messaged somebody messaged on one of my videos as i was doing that research like i love me a good a, a good ton of research you know, he said something like that it was a cool comment, you know, but then I was thinking, yeah, I'm sitting here right now with like coffee and the TV on, uh, watching Escape from Tarkov streamers, and I'm going nuts doing research over here. It was insane trying to find these patents for these. Marlin patents are tough. They really are. They had a lot of people working for them and a lot of like guys that worked on a lot. They have... 500 patents to their name so a lot of times you look up one guy and then you would just cross-reference his patents and you'd say let me look at all the patents this guy did and you'd find other ones that he did for marlin or whatever but some of these guys i'm like i'm not looking through 500 patents to try to find another gun one you know what i mean and it's like he he invented you know the most amazing feed mechanism for a marlin 22 rifle then the next thing he invented was like a heated hairbrush you know what i mean and it's it's like so all over the place um and then not only that if you look up marlin's patents they seem pretty there were so many of them in the 1800s and then it seemed to kind of fall off almost like when you look there's marlin and company marlin firearms well there's like three four different um ways their company is written and it's like was that during because of buyouts or because of like you know who knows but that's why the patent research can really get crazy, you know, unless you have like probably there's like real software just made for that kind of thing for that actual inventors and patent people use would probably be easier. Um, so what should we jump into now? Well, let's take a look. I'll show you what the what the brass. Uh, the brass getting hit looks like it's always a good good on these 22s to check that out. I should start doing that more often. But on this one, I thought it was interesting because uh, not one failure to feed, not one misfire. And we're talking about 22s here. I mean, look how perfect. It's not misshaping the rim. Something about Marlins is the most awesome rim contact. See how that's just perfect. It's just enough of a dent without being drastic where you're destroying it where you know it's like the firing pin is smashing into the into the uh breach you know every time you if you dry fire it or whatever which not sure if this is one of the ones that does damage but um it uh it definitely um works well well and we'll show you some shooting video later on let's while we're here, let's let's take a look at what we're messing with with these patents. So, first we have T.R. Robinson Jr. And you know what? I'm gonna let's take the gun down for just a moment because what I want to do is I want to get up the uh, Brophy book. And let's let me show you what I'm dealing with when I deal with dating. So. When you find where this guy is on the list here, 41 to 64. So you go, okay, pre-war to post-war. Interesting. So you're going straight across the war. Obviously, they stopped making them. Maybe the war effort slowed them down. But is that where one of the changeovers goes? And I don't, I don't think so. I think from 41 straight through to 52... They stayed with their version one, I thought. This is what I thought. That's why I dated this one, the 52. Because 52 comes the new patented extractor introduced in the models 80 and 81. Okay, now here's the three versions right here. You see on the top, 
Now, it doesn't matter if these are the 80 or the 81. These might be the 80 because they're box magazine, but it doesn't matter because they're the same gun, just different magazine. So the 80, the 80 on top, you see, the version 1, you could see that the extractor is different. It's not that collar extractor. It's not the extractor in this patent that looks like that, that goes across the top of the bolt. And that, I would guess, would be the first version. So if the new patented extractor kicks in in 52, this would have to be a 52. The 81 DL would have to be because 53, it would have AccuGroove and it does not have AccuGroove. Here's the difference between the AccuGroove and the Ballard, just looking at it. I am 100% sure it doesn't say AccuGroove on the barrel and it is definitely Ballard rifling. This is why I'm dating it for 1952, but I'm seeing different stuff in here. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm seeing they're showing in here the different versions. Where are they? So this is the model 100. Here, first variation of the model 80 rifle. Cool. It has that weird looking trigger guard that's like a stamped metal and this uh weird looking cocking piece on the back great so then how come when i see here second variation of the model 80 and it still has that trigger guard so that's a little confusing then when i got up here where is it? Then here, here's the 80 deal. Here's second variation. It has this weird oblong trigger guard that was on. Here's the here's the 80 with that oblong trigger guard, right? And here's the 81. It just has that small round trigger guard. And you can see that in this picture right here of all three, that it would be second variation to third variation, right? Hope you're following me. This is getting weird. It's getting complicated, right? But now this is showing here that that trigger guard, that rounded looking trigger guard, first variation of the 80 DL. And this, this, this looks like, I mean, maybe mine could potentially be part of the first series. Second and then, right? I mean, isn't that, isn't that starting to get confusing? Here, second, second variation of the 80C, second variation has the oblong trigger guard, not the rounded one like this. So then th that's it, then it's not making sense. Again, it's not making sense. And what they write here on the 81 doesn't seem to clear it up. They don't really break it down by the numbers. They break down exactly how much they cost year by year, but not how to break it down, like not just straight up talk to tell me how to break it down year by year so you know what i went with what i got which is 1952 that's what i got the bottom line is it has to be before 53 and it has to be after 41. um no it has to be it has to be after 52 because that's when this extractor kicked in i'm sorry it has to be after 52 but and and it ha and Michael Groove is fifty three. It has to be. It has to be a fifty two, right? That's what I would think. That's where I landed. So this patent is very interesting. T. R. Robinson Jr. He's the one that patented this extractor for Marlin. It's on a lot of stuff. It's on Marlin shotguns even, and it's basically a collar that clips over the bolt. Very interesting, and um, you could take a look at it later on. Oh, you know what? I did a little bit of a changing to this uh aperture site where it was mounted i had to i had to adjust it when i went shooting to be hitting the target and when i did that i put it in a position where the bolt uh doesn't come out anymore see it hits the aperture site so i'm not going to be able to remove the bolt to show you that i'm not i have it sighted perfect and i'm not going to mess with it but basically there it is i mean it clips on you could see it just like pushes down and clips over the bolt simple as can be 
and it has like a locating tab and an extractor tab. And these marlins, you got to be careful when you clean them with like a boar snake or whatever. Because there's a, see that clip up front right here? These these get broken a lot. And I'm assuming it's from like boar snakes or when you're cleaning with a rod. You don't just push it through and catch the patch on it. You have to be really careful that you don't catch patches or cleaning stuff on it. Because that, we're going to take a look in a little bit. That helps to, because there is no feed ramp with these. Look at that internal mechanism in there. It looks like uh, the mouth of a crab or something. It's going to be pretty interesting to check out to see how that works. But uh, I just figured while I'm poking around in here to let you know, do not touch. Do not, well, you could touch it. Just <laughs> don't even touch it. Don't, just don't even touch it. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. So that's the extractor. And then R.L. Jenkinson. This is as close as I could come. I am sorry. I just uh, did my best to find this patent. And of course... It can't be a patent from like 68 or something like that because you're like, no, that was way back in 41 when this came out, right? This is 47. So you'd think that, and it's semi-auto. So you would, you'd be like, well, how is that? Maybe this is like the patent from the 88 DL, you know what I mean? Um, because that gun came out in 53. So the, uh, the 88 DL didn't come out until they was active groove. And my 81 DL was discontinued before my 80C even was produced. So as, as much as these are all in the same family, uh, there wasn't much rubbing shoulders going on across these, these because of these different versions and stuff. But I'm only hoping that the patents carried through. This looks very similar, um, a, a little, but not 100%. But this might have been enough of what Marlin patented to carry over to what we're going to look at in here. But this is a, a fascinating one. It really is a fascinating one. Breach, bolt, and retracting means, therefore, Teaneck, New Jersey, a signer to the Marlin, Marlin Firearms Company, New Haven, Connecticut, a corporation of Connecticut, a corporation of Connecticut, sorry, application September 4th, 1944. So you see, this was sometimes, you know, the, the patents doesn't mean you can't produce it until you have a patent. Sometimes you make something and then it becomes successful and it works and you patent it, you patent it after, you know, so there's a chance that the gun could come out in 41. It's like wartime now. You're not really producing that many. I mean, it's kind of weird for, for a gun to come out the same year that, Pearl Harbor was bombed in December, you know what I mean, of 41. So the gun comes out in 41, and you're right into World War II. So you might not have been thinking about much till 44 rolls around. You're kind of in the middle of the war, but things have, uh, you know, a lot of stuff has returned to normal. Maybe they got the patent then. Um, this, is all, this is all part of the research. It involves history. It involves everything. But for me, it involved looking at, a thousand different Marlin patents and other kinds of patents. And that's the closest I can come to. But one cool thing is no matter what we can take our realistic snap caps. Realistic snap caps are a welcome addition to our uh, research and function testing here at the mill Surf garage. I love these things. Um, this company is one of the tops for our support uh, here. I love these things. We are all about function testing and we are all about safety and I will not have any other, um, I will not use anything plastic or aluminum when making all these pieces inside the guns. And it's the only way to truthfully function test what you got, uh, completely safe and inert. There is nothing inside of these things, no primer in the rim, no powder in it, nothing. And uh, the 22 ones, have been really cool to play around with. And if you if you go to these guys' website, um, uh, anything you buy there, you put in coupon code MILSERP Garage, one word, and you get 10% off. How do you like that? So we're gonna function, we're gonna um, do some function testing with it. We haven't done this in a while. I'm excited, you know, like the 22s and looking at how they work. And I did not practice this beforehand, so give me a break. If uh, I'm hoping that. This gun will function and cycle with the stock with, with the action out of the stock 
actually, you know, like I always wonder, uh, do any of these actually use the stock for any like springs pushing against it or anything happening where if you try to work it without the stock, that it won't work? I never know. And uh, this one, we're going to try it right now. Again, look at this bit. Look, look at how wide that bit is. It's because this screw is that wide. I could stand this up in there. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a bit that you can't go click, 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 click back and forth in here. Can you take any other small bit? Whereas, well, like here's a small one, right? Smaller one, I should say. This isn't even small itself. This is pretty wide in itself. This is like somebody's widest screwdriver could look like that, right? See what happens in here? Listen. See that movement? That back and forth movement will put marks, upraised marks on here. You can see, if you look really close, there are a couple of them there already. See them right there? See those mark, those edge where the screwdriver edge marred it? I don't know why, but that bothers me. I don't want to see anybody doing that. You get a nice big wide bit. I'm going to lay this down actually because this one, pretty sure with these Marlins, they're not like, you know, four turns. These are like super fine threads on these, and they turn forever. And this way, look, when we get these 22s, they've been through a lot. 1952 is a long time ago. I think they have enough marks and mars. And if they don't, like this one is in beautiful shape. Look at the wood on this thing. And, uh, you know, how... What bad karma that would be for you to put marks on it. See what I'm talking about? How fine these are. And they come right. It's not like they're capture screws. They come right out. So let's de-stock this thing. Will it just come right out? Did I, am I doing something wrong? Is there another step? No, nope, there it goes. All right. Let me check to make sure. If this is all in the right spot, oh, looks like that. Did that move? Hmm. Is that even in the right spot? Let me take a close look here. This is uh looks like it's tweaked a little bit here. This might have gotten ah, oh, this got stuck on this pin right here. Look at that. This isn't supposed to be on here. All right. Let me get something to get that off of there. I knew that didn't look right. See how that's all crooked? It was working, but... Or is this one, that's supposed to be hooked around the other one, right? Maybe that's it. Yeah. How did that pop out of there? It's not that this was hooked around there. That's supposed to be. And this one was supposed to be hooked over there. Right? Let's see if it works now. Yeah, it was, it was working, but it was not in the right spot. I'm going to take a close look at that uh, post video because it should be it should be hooked really good around that pin and it wasn't. So glad to have you there with me while we uh, noticed that. Seems okay now. It seems to be hanging out in the right spot. But uh, yeah, that popped off of there. There's just still enough spring pressure on it to... Uh, hold it in place but that was not in the right spot all right so let's take a look let's see if we can see actually see this mechanism here look at how you see the the load the loading like tube on there almost that's part of this stamp steel piece interesting so now you got to look you're like is that is that on here? Is that loading tube on this stamp steel piece? Not really. It shows a lifter here. Yeah, not 100% sure. 
that this is the correct patent for uh, for this. But this right here is what they call this was was the patented non-jamming feed. It's the patented spring jumping off the post mechanism. Let's get a few of these uh, snap caps in here and see what happens. Where'd they go? Put them over here. Let's do uh, three. And uh, don't you guys mess around with function testing and be like, oh, I don't need those snap caps. I'm just going to do it with some rounds. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I'm smarter than that. Oh, that's not my fault. That wasn't the gun's fault. It was my fault. I wasn't pushing. I was see. Sometimes you see this guy, and you think that is the the pin that's got to go in there, but it's not. There's only one pin, and that's the pin. So if this pin is lined up with that. Look, I'll take it off. This is how you know it's a good magazine. It's eating up those rounds every time without balking. And then uh, look at how cool it put it in there like that. And you see that, see that clip? See how important that clip is? You see what it did, right? That clip up front is what locates it. That was nice. And then there's that patented extractor. Look at how the next round, the next round is like kind of like what pushes it out. Oh, that is awesome. That is awesome. And here's that clip again in action. Boom. See that clip? Without that clip, it would probably porpoise up and just get stuck in there. So if your rifle's doing that and that clip isn't there, that's that's why. Once again, look at how there's one right there behind. Look at that. That is so awesome. And even last round, doesn't matter. With these Marlins, whoops. With these Marlins, it just doesn't matter. Yeah, we can't drop the firing pin on these because, of course, they are like regular. These are actually CCI brass. And if you uh, if you drop a firing pin on them, you're going to... You can do that if you want to function test for... To use these up. It's kind of like an expensive proposition to use these just for that. You could take uh, spent cases... And, uh, and you could do that with it. Once a, once a rimfire case is shot, that's it. It's not like there's going to be any more primer material or powder in it. It's empty. These would be just as safe as long as they, you see that they were hit. And uh, again, even then, you got to be careful. Because uh, you don't know if somebody had a failure to detonate. And then, I don't know, rip the bullet out, dump the powder out, and just toss it. And then there's still primer in the case. Who knows? This is really the only true way, you know, unless they're your own rimfire brass that you could use for uh, firing pin um, hit testing. You know what I mean? To see how they're hitting. Let's do that again. I like the way that, I like the way that feeds. I um, was a little bugged out about that spring, though, the way that looked. I knew right away because I had researched it and seen pictures, and I was inside the gun. I was in, don't get me wrong, I, I've been inside this gun. I just haven't done this function testing. And uh, when I was doing something, one of these did pop off. One of these did kind of go like that and come off. And I, you know, cleaning it or something. And I was like, ooh, that spring came off of there. And you see how there's like the two arms that hook around that to push this up. And, uh, the bolt pushes it down, but it's spring-loaded up. You could push it from the inside. This is spring-loaded, the lifter and this body that guides the round. But this spring does everything, and uh, it's pretty important. And the fact that it was hanging off like that, I'm going to have to check to make sure that it's... Maybe when I restocked it, I, I bumped it and knocked it off. It wasn't off when I first took it off, so maybe I did it. And again, are those in there? Did I put them in there? I thought I'd, yeah, you could see, you could see that one way down there, and it, it's being pushed by the magazine spring, but you see that this right there is blocking it. 
So you can't really see what's going on in here, unfortunately, just because it's all so, it's all so uh, shrouded. But when you close it, now that lifter went low enough that allows the rear of this round to come up to here. Now when you open, it's gonna come up, it's gonna push it up under the bolt and get it into position right there. When the bolt closes, it's gonna hit, catch on the rim. That lifter is gonna, that uh, clip is gonna keep it from porpoising up and push the nose right into the breech. Then that lifter, that kick right there, that puts it right in place. It's kind of like controlled feed because even at this point, I could eject it if I wanted to. I don't have another round there yet. I'd have to go back and forth to get another round there. But it is technically like a controlled feed 22. Pretty cool. Close. This is the part I love. And look how slow you could go and still eject the round. I love how the, what, the next one comes and pushes it out. What an awesome design, huh? Marlin. So these, uh, these two mags are better also because you have, you could mix and match ammo in them as well, you know? Short, long, long rifle. Let's uh, clean this off a little bit and restock it, huh? Careful, I ain't going anywhere near them springs. <laughs> tell you that right now. So, let's see if maybe that's what I did last time. This time I'm going to be really careful going in, and I'm going to make sure I definitely went in straight in without that spring getting knocked off. So, I'm going to go next time I shoot it. I'm going to make sure this actually threads in the wood. So you want to make sure you're not cross-threading or you're not crooked because you'll cut new threads right through that wood real easy. So you just want to make sure, do a few turns like that, make sure you're going into the threads properly and hold it together. Hold it all the way together, solid, strong. I'm squeezing tight to make sure there's no gap between the wood and the metal. So this screw goes right from the wood right into the nub that was there that this is because this is the only screw that holds it together this is still back in the day of one screw takedowns and for a deluxe target model this is an important screw you know you want to make sure it's bedding everything just right that's why you hold it together like that not just that but how hard you screw this is important too i'm going to give you my best uh guidance and explanation so it touches and you're feeling some resistance now, right? Here's what you do. Let's just get the screwdriver, the bit in there nice where you know you got a nice bite. It's perfect. And you just give it a, eh. And then maybe a little tweak after that. <laughs> That's it. You got to know that that amount of torque right there. You have to just know, man, without those snap caps, what are, what are you going to do? cycle like well like i heard people using like like anchors the plastic like wall anchors as snap caps come on how are you really going to function test with a wall anchor you know you're going to go to the range and be embarrassed because your 22 is not working right and you're going to be like i don't know i don't I can't figure it out it worked just fine with wall anchors people are going to be like have you been drinking because you would really need to use something that looks like this, you know, to really function test, right? Wouldn't it make sense? It's the right material. How does the gun know there isn't any powder in here? You know what I mean? I mean, the only thing you can't test is, uh, you know, like stuff that you have to do at the range is like if you're firing and you're having trouble with extraction, you know, when the gun is hot and the brass is expanded against the chamber, things like that, of course, you're going to need to do live firing, but you're going to be at a range for that. And uh, that's the place for live ammo, the range. Uh, in your shop, just to do function testing for feeding and ejection and extraction and stuff like that, you're not gonna, you don't want to use live ammo. No live ammo in the shop. What else do we got on this thing? I, I got some really cool, uh, oh, the shooting video. I'll put up the shooting video. 
and I'll tell you what it was like to uh, shoot this thing. So it was uh, amazing with these peep sights, how when you look through these peep sights, right, it's a very different look than lining up sights. You're lining up sights. You're actually, I mean, you're lining up the sights. You have to put the front sight inside the rear sight. All that whole picture has to be right on the bullseye. When you're using these types of like aperture sights, I this is why I say I hate them. I don't hate them like someone would say, oh, you don't like using them, like sighting through them. No, I love sighting through them. I just hate them physically, trying to get a gun that has the whole aperture sight every time. I never bought a gun that had the entire complete correct aperture sight ever. You know, so that's what they just like so messed with. You know, they're always bungled, missing something. It's like people cannot keep their hands off aperture sights for some reason. So that's why I don't like them. But sighting, sighting wise, they're so interesting to me. It's fascinating how you're just looking through a hole. And then in that hole, you're looking at the front sight. It's just like I'm looking at the front sight. It's not like I'm lining it up to anything. I'm just putting it in a spot where I'm like, there you go. I can see the globe front sight perfectly right in the middle of the hole that I'm looking through, right? And then with that, so now you're looking through that and you're going, okay, so now that globe has a hole in it. And I'm like, I see red through the globe. Like I'm right on the center of the target. And man, you're, you're right in there. I can never be as consistent with any other site. The consistency that I have with the aperture sites is amazing. I, I don't think it's just me because that's they're made for target shooting. So it must be that everybody shoots better with them. That's what they're for. They're target sites. But they really fascinate me because it's like magic almost. I feel like I am not controlling the sight picture as much. Yet, it's uh, amazing accuracy. I don't know if you've seen the target yet with this round that I'm shooting here or these couple of rounds that I got. Um, but, uh, this thing, it's shoulders nice. It's what well, the bolt on these, on these, both the 80 and the 81, I got to admit, you got to really work this bolt, man. This bolt is like, this thing is like, well, it's like a, like a tool, like an old school. It's like, it's, if it was steering, it would be like non power steering. You know what I mean? It's not smooth. Well, it feels smooth, but you know what I mean? It's not. It's not like a Cadillac. It's not like some of these uh, Winchesters or Remingtons. You know, it's Marlin has its own thing. It's like Marlins kind of like demand a lot out of you. I noticed that they're they're precision and they're good. They're well made, but it's like these twenty twos. You got to work that bolt. I mean, if you, if you're not paying attention, it's gonna slip right out of your hand. It's the kind of gun where the handle slips out of your hand a lot because you got to really torque this thing. This thing demands to be worked. You know, so. Um, there's that. I mean, and that's good for, uh, you know, I'm all for it. I'm okay with that. I, I'll, uh, some guns need to be manhandled. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. I understand. It's like a gun that you gotta mean what you say, you know, and, uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm not a big fan of safeties, but this one, it is a little weird. This one that's like counterintuitive. It's like pushing it forward, puts it on and usually forward, it's like you push towards the target to shoot, I guess, kind of normally, don't you? Seems like it's a little backwards. I don't really mess with safeties enough to know, but read a lot about people saying they don't really like the safety because it goes backwards, you know? But uh, everything seems ergonomic on it and works just fine. Just, uh, you know, you really got to... You really got to work it. And it, this one, this particular one, this is like a, these are like a, like a walnut, like a genuine walnut stock, these deluxes, you know? And an interesting thing about this is uh, it play, it plays like a note, like every time you shoot. Like to you, it just sounds like a crack. I know that. I listened to this video, like the video of when I'm, uh, when, after I made it, the video, the shooting video to hear if I could hear that. But with the gun against my head, it would ring every shot. It would be like, Doom! It literally played like a tone, like it was ringing like a tuning fork. And uh, you're either going to love that or hate it, but it certainly going to go away. There's nothing you're going to do to get it to get it to go away. But it was very unique. I never really heard a rifle doing that. And both of them, the 80 and the 81, both do it. And I thought that was kind of thought that was kind of interesting. That literally every time you shot, it sounded like someone was banging a tuning fork against your head. 
you know. And uh, yeah, then the ho the hooded front sight on this was uh, was nice. So so this one didn't have the eight. The, it was the five twenty one T that had the globe front sight. This one just had the bead, the gold, the shiny bead. And that was the same thing. It was like, it was, you just look right through that aperture hole and put like the bead right in it. And it just, just, just didn't even feel like, it didn't even feel like you, you were really lining up sights as accurately as you would with a conventional sight, which it seems like it's just it's harder to do. You know, it's like, you gotta be like these minuscule little movements and you see the sights wandering around. Seems like with these aperture sights, nothing wanders. You just put the bead right in the hole. You go, yep, bead's in the hole. It's right on the center of the target. Bang. So at 40 feet, punching holes like that in the target for me is uh, considered uh, pretty good. And uh, I guess that's it. I had some really cool advertising uh, photos from Marlin that I found for this video. I just like to share what I find and what I read. And these awesome rifles with you and uh that's the marlin 81 deluxe ladies and gentlemen and uh that's two 22 rifles with aperture sights in a row a mill surf garage first and uh next video we're coming back with a we're going modern and we're gonna go pistol so come check it out. Love to have you along. Thank you, subscribers. And we're, by the way, we're on our way to 10,000 subscribers. Uh, Going to have a little Millsurf Garage party here when we hit it. So tell your friends. Share the channel with people. Put up a nice thing at your shooting range and say, check out Millsurf Garage. Let's get to 10,000. And uh, we will celebrate. Promise we will celebrate all together. I'll see you all later. Take care.